Greetings shippers, a lot of you guys have been requesting this one for some time, so without further ado, it's time to take a look at Clans. The pairing of Keith and Lance from Voltron Legendary Defender. As always, follow me on Twitter so you can keep up with what's coming up next. Let's get started. Voltron has been another huge success for Netflix. Their revival of the nostalgic 80s anime has drawn in new viewers and also hit beyond their target demographic as well. And it's of course picked up those with a healthy helping of nostalgia. And while there are definitely things to critique, the overall consensus is that it's a very solid cartoon, packaged extremely well for children, yet still watchable for adults even if it rarely actively tries to engage them, which is absolutely fine. And on the few occasions that it does, it can be pretty successful at it. The original Voltron was one of those shows that had access to licensed Japanese material, but no means to translate it. So the story and animation were very much cobbled together for the American version, complete with censorship, of course. The first season consisted mostly of chopped up animation from the anime Beast King Go Lion, while season two took segments from an unrelated anime, Armored Fleet Diruger 15. This new the revival was a blend of many plot points, some modified, some original, and was definitely what its target audience wanted. Plenty of action, easy to identify characters, and some mature themes that are pretty quickly worked through and resolved. From all of this, of course, came the ships, though in this case for many, that fact was surprising. More on that later. Be that as it may, one ship came to vastly outnumber the rest, and that was Clance. So why are people gravitating towards this ship? Well, let's meet the players and find out. So let's start with Lance, who if you're into animation, you may have noticed is voiced by none other than Jeremy Shada, AKA Finn the Human, which really shows at times and can make for some amusing moments. Lance is the cocky hotshot of the group. He thinks he's the best and wants to be the best. Yes, there are some moments of insecurity, but they are quickly recovered from by his buoyant, borderline obnoxious personality. A loyal friend and always up for a good time or scheme, Lance is also girl crazy, attracted to any pretty face, and flirts openly and aggressively. He's slightly immature, but definitely competent and capable of coming through in a crunch, though he might also run off and leave you in a lurch for a pretty face. His ego leads him to butting heads with people when they challenge this status, and for the most part, that brings him into conflict with Keith. Speaking of Keith, who you may have noticed is voiced by none other than Steven Yoon, aka Glenn, from The Walking Dead. I'm so glad space is working out better for him than the zombie apocalypse. Go figure. As for Keith, he's more the lone wolf of the group, the most independent and also the most likely to go off on his own. Keith has to learn to trust people other than himself and Shiro. Immensely talented and competent, Keith is very mature and determined, though slightly less mature than he likes to think or portray himself as, which is most often seen in his interactions with Lance, as the two cannot resist baiting each other. He too is loyal and brave. He has innate leadership abilities that are beginning to emerge more and more as he gains confidence in himself and learns who he is. These two characters are set up as rivals from the outset. The only reason Lance is at the top of his class is because Keith flunked out due to a discipline problem. Coupled with the fact that Keith is so focused on his own objectives, he's rarely actively competing with Lance and has to be goaded into it. As a result, the two have a very ridicule-filled relationship where they banter back and forth to see who can do things better and regularly call out the other in public as an attempt to show, again, who's better and get the other's attention. Despite this, they work well together on a team and their banter does not get in the way of their duty most of the time. And they can acknowledge when one of them has a good idea. They've saved each other, fought beside each other, and are generally decent, if somewhat petty at times, comrades. This ship is everywhere in this fandom, and a large portion of it has an element that is common to many ships, and that is rivalry. These characters are trying to prove themselves to each other and have charged interactions with the other. This leads many to extrapolate and want to see more of their interactions. The key word here being more, because these two don't interact that much. In fact, barely at all. They rarely go on missions together, and lots of their character development moments occur separately. And character development moments on this show come quickly, as this show is very much paced for children. It moves rapidly and doesn't linger very long on most concepts, though it will on occasion return to them. So let's do something a little different. We're going to break down the whys and why nots of this ship simultaneously, because for this pairing, they occasionally overlap or tie into something else altogether. Many claim that Clance is boring and has little to 
no canonical backing and are baffled as to how it has become so huge. For many, the rival dynamic in shipping is played out and there simply isn't enough interaction or enough new takes added to it to make clans interesting to them. For this, it is very important to remember Voltron's target demographic, which is definitely younger, closer to tweens and early teens than the young adult crowd and beyond who have recently gotten very vocal and engaged in the animation scene. Voltron knows its audience, and it hits. Despite this, for many watching Voltron, there are several elements that are extremely derivative, plot-wise, aesthetic-wise, character-wise, but they are used well so they don't become overwhelming for most. Again, there are exceptions. However, not everyone has seen everything, and not everyone is coming at this from having shipped for a long time. Or at all. Based upon the viewing ages and show demographics, it is conceivable that while yes, there is a sizable older audience, for many, Clance may be their first ship. For a first ship, Clance makes a lot of sense. It has all the hallmarks of other more developed rival ships. And for those whom it is not their first, the stories provide enough elements for them to play with and extrapolate, which many find quite enjoyable. For those whom it is their first, let's everyone take a moment and think back to their first ship. Was it full of depth or passion from a show or work full of amazing nuance? Probably not, but by shipping it, one learned how to extract and find said nuance. That may be some of what is going on with Clance. Back to extrapolation. Some find this iteration of Voltron to be a vast universe full of unexplored potential, ripe with story possibilities. And they lament that the characters don't interact more and use fiction and art to depict the situations they imagine the crew and particularly these two could get into. The characters do have a lot in common and are both fundamentally kind and understanding. As a result, there are definitely stories that could be told about these two finding each other and coming together, forming a unique bond in some ways forged from their past as rivals. Fiction for these two is varied, usually expansions upon themes or additional adventures, but also AUs. Your standard modern day university AU of course, and lest we forget, the ever present coffee shop. However, there are some who say not only do these characters barely interact, but they actively dislike each other. Some go so far as to say hate, which given the depth of character development on Voltron seems to be a bit of a stretch. Many of these are antis, people who violently oppose a certain ship, and some come from this show's rival ship known as Sheath, that being the pairing of Shiro and Keith. The antis from these two ships go back and forth, launching accusations at each other and scrutinizing episodes for evidence to debunk the other. Antis on the Sheath side claim that Keith and Lance can barely stand each other, and their relationships are unhealthy and those who ship it are immature and twisting the plot to their own ends. While antis on the Clant side claim Sheath is a predatory ship with pedophilic undertones, while others just feel that all of these are gross over-exaggerations not in any way hinted at or implied by the text. And of course, lest anyone forget, there are always the multi-shippers, people who are supporting both of these ships and even more simultaneously. Sadly, they often get lost in the dichotomous turn lots of these discussions seem to make. Some feel that perhaps the clan's backlash may be a result of its dominance within the fandom, as it is literally everywhere. It can be a bit harder to find others who ship a less common ship, which can become tiresome. As always, no shipper or non-shipper should resort to bullying to try and stop someone from shipping what they ship. That was a lot of ships in one sentence. There simply aren't enough civil discussions about fandom or anything else these days, really. Still more feel that Voltron is unworthy of all this attention in general, and that for all its good qualities, it's nothing revolutionary. Some have praised it as one of the best depictions of animated PTSD. Is that because it is? Or is it because so many other works stumble on these topics so badly? Voltron is well constructed, but its characters are still largely archetype based, and they rarely break out of their roles, and when they do, it is usually to advance the plot. Not that there's anything wrong with archetypes, they can be quite effective and create some very likable characters. And while they may not have the most depth, that doesn't mean that they don't develop or that they can't have complex stories built around them. This can in many cases make the characters more easy to identify with for the audience since it's easier for them to imprint upon them. However, the same dynamic, especially when present in a team, which tends to be a good place to use archetypical characters, can result in a lack of shipping. Because the characters all have such good chemistry together as friends, which can result in people gravitating towards more 
more gen fiction, or team as family. Which is, for example, something you can see in the Guardians of the Galaxy fandom. Not that people aren't shipping, but there is also a large number who prefer to keep things more PG. Yet another thought, some feel people are projecting more onto this show than is there, bolstering it past when it perhaps deserves, in part because of some of the names and animation and story attached to it, or perhaps out of nostalgia. Which is not to say that Voltron has no depth, because it definitely does. It has even managed to garner its own fan theories, many of which have come to fruition. This may be in part because, if you're aware of the archetypes and tropes that the show is working through, these clues are less hidden and more like foreshadowing. Which again, can be quite enjoyable. But for others who are more familiar with these tropes, they may seem less exciting lead into a bit of a disconnect between these and people who are truly excited by these things that seem novel. And of course, there are just people who have gotten really invested in this show, regardless of whether they find it obvious or not. Others feel it's an enjoyable watch no matter how deep or not deep, and say just let it be what it is. It's a show for some, but not for others. There are viewers that find it too kiddy and they're simply too old for it, which again, it's completely fine. It's not obnoxious in its kid-based slant, and there's nothing wrong with not being into every single cult hit. One thing is certain, following the cliffhanger of season two, fans eagerly await season three, as the plot continues to thicken and hurtle forward at warp speed. And who knows, Keith and Lance may get that screen time that fans of them are hoping for. Only time will tell. All in all, Clance is a harmless and understandable ship that takes a little work to get behind if you're someone who enjoys canonically based interactions as a foundation. But those shipping it are having fun, creating beautiful art, creative videos, and some very well-written pieces. So if Clance is for you, there's tons out there to explore. And if not, no worries, there are plenty of other ships out there. Are you guys Clance shippers? How have you been enjoying Voltron? I may need to make an episode about how this show handled a certain Keith character reveal because, man, were there issues. Thanks so much for watching Shipper's Guide to the Galaxy. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and stay tuned, for there are as many ships out there as there are stars in the sky.